Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to talk about some basic homeowner tools, and we'd like to thank TP for giving us a five-star rating and review on Amazon for our 12th ebook. It's called Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Book 12, and you can check it out on Amazon. It's only a dollar. Axes and hammers with a wood handle date back around 30,000 years. The Hammer Museum in Haines, Alaska has a hammer from around 2500 BC, and they think it was used to help build the third pyramid in Giza. Hmm. Something in a field trip. Get some pictures for Instagram. (laughs) Ancient Egypt had copper hand saws around 3000 BC. Egyptian blacksmiths had wood pliers around 3000 BC. The first screwdrivers were used in the 1500s. The first standardized screwdrivers were produced in the 1700s. And this is after metal screws started becoming mass produced in uniform sizes. Hmm. We've had a few emails asking about the basic tools that every homeowner should have for common projects around the house. Harvard University says about 40% of the homes in the U.S. are at least 50 years old. Hmm. According to the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors, a recent study of over 50,000 homes found that the most common repairs needed on an older home were doors that needed to be adjusted so they closed properly, faucets that had to either be repaired or replaced, and they said over half of the homes that they looked at They needed some type of exterior caulking done, caulk replaced, or cracks filled on the exterior of the house, and also they needed more weather stripping. Hmm. A Harvard University study said common projects for a homeowner are remodeling a kitchen or a bathroom, flooring, paneling, ceiling tiles, replacing a dishwasher, garbage disposal, windows, doors, or a water heater, And Realtor.com says almost 60% of home shoppers are willing to purchase a home that's going to need repairs. Interesting. If you move into an older home, you may want to replace all the outlets and switches to a different color or add GFCIs and AFCIs to make your home safer. Mm -hmm. GFCIs are going to protect you against shock hazards and AFCIs will protect you against potential fire hazards. Right. We've talked about this a lot. Yeah, we've had some good episodes on those. (laughs) To replace outlets and switches, you're going to need a Phillips screwdriver and a slotted screwdriver. The number two Phillips is going to be the most common size. A number one is smaller, and that's a good size to have. A number three is larger than a number two, but you're not going to be using that size as often for projects. Mm Mm-hmm. Three sixteenths, five sixteenths, and quarter inch slotted screwdrivers are going to be good sizes for projects around the house. You can either purchase a set, which sometimes will save you some money, or you can purchase a screwdriver that comes with different tips or right. multiple tips. So I looked at a two piece screwdriver set from Klein Tools. It has a number two Phillips and a quarter inch slotted. I looked at a six piece screwdriver set from Milwaukee. It had one number one Phillips two number two Phillips, and it was two different lengths, a quarter inch, a three sixteenths, and a five sixteenths slotted. A Craftsman two piece was a number two Phillips and a quarter inch slotted. And a Craftsman eight piece had a number one Phillips, two number two Phillips in different lengths, and a number three Phillips. And then it had a three sixteenths slotted, quarter inch in two different lengths, and a five sixteenths. So you can kind of see the main sizes they feel that the average person should have. That was a lot of numbers. (laughs) And when you're comparing screwdrivers that come with multiple tips, it's nice to get one that includes square, torx, and hex. And some of these are magnetic, which will help hold onto a screw in tight spaces. I would also compare the warranty and look at quality screwdrivers. Inexpensive Phillips, for example, can wear or crack if you're using them a lot. Hmm. For replacing switches and outlets, you might need needle-nose pliers and wire strippers. 
And make sure you always turn off the power to any circuit you're working on and then verify that it's off with a tester. A shock under the right conditions can be deadly. Right. For your electrical projects, you should have a non-contact electrical tester and a multimeter. An outlet tester is good for troubleshooting and to test all the outlets in your home, especially if you've moved into an older home. An outlet tester is going to let you know if the outlets are correctly polarized. If you, you have explain what that means. For safety, the hot wire should be connected to the brass screw terminals on the outlet, the side with the narrow slots, and the white wire, the neutral wire, should be connected to the silver screws on the side with the longer slots or the wider slots. And this way, the electricity is flowing through things the right way for safety. Let's say you plug a lamp into an outlet and the previous owner changed the outlets, but he wired them backwards. Your lamp will still work. It'll turn on and off. But when you turn that light bulb off and you remove the bulb, that socket is still live if you have reverse polarity, which could be a shock hazard and potentially deadly. So an outlet tester is going to make sure it's correctly polarized if you have any disconnected wires and your outlets are grounded properly. Mm -hmm. Some top-rated electrical testers come from Klein Tools, Gardner Bender, G-A-R-D-N-E-R, capital B-E-N, D-E-R, Sperry, S-P-E-R-R-Y, and Fluke, F-L-U-K-E. For some electrical projects, it's helpful to have a good work light or a flashlight. Depending on your home and the amount of circuits, when you turn off the electric to the area you're working on, it's nice to have a flashlight so you're able to get back to the area, <laughs> and then a work light to see what you're doing. Right. I like a headlamp. It puts the light right where you're looking and your hands are free. Westgate, it's W-E-S-T-G-A-T-E. They have a small cordless LED portable work light. It has a hook so you can hang it. The feet are magnetized so you can put it against something metal and it rotates and swivels. You can also get an optional solar panel to charge it. So this cool. is good also, you know, for camping or backpacking. Right. The X-Torch flashlight, it's just the letter X, T-O-R-C-H. This has built-in solar panels, so you keep it out. It's always going to have a charge. It has a flashlight on the end and a hook on the opposite end. If you set it on the flashlight end, it has a lantern on the side of it. Okay. So this can be charged by the sun, or you can plug it in to charge it if it's dark out. You can also use the rechargeable battery to charge other devices. So this is good as a work light also if you're going camping. Bosch. DeWalt, Milwaukee, Klein Tools, and Ryobi also make top-rated work lights. And many of the cordless power tool combo kits mm -hmm. will come with a work light that uses the same battery as the tools, so that's pretty convenient. Cool. To remove and replace the drain pipe under a kitchen or a bathroom sink, you're going to need tongue and groove pliers. And they're also good for a wide range of projects. You can use it for changing your garbage disposal removing nuts and bolts, threaded pipe. It's good for automotive projects. If you're repairing a bike, it has a jaw that adjusts to a variety of positions and sizes. Right. 10-inch or 12-inch tongue and groove pliers are a good size for common projects around the house. There are a few different jaw designs with the tongue and groove pliers. A straight jaw is the most versatile for homeowners. You can have serrated teeth, and that's going to help you grab onto nuts, bolts, and pipe or a smooth jaw, and that helps prevent damage to surfaces that are exposed. If you have a shower head, for example, that you're tightening, right. or a faucet cover. Mm -hmm. For faucet repair, you may need a tongue and groove smooth jaw pliers, if that's what you have, or you can use an adjustable wrench to remove the decorative cover over a cartridge or stem. You know, different faucets will need different tools, mm -hmm. but that's pretty common. You'll sometimes need a precision screwdriver to remove the cap over the set screw on the handle. Mm -hmm. That set screw could be a hex screw. You have standard hex wrenches and metric hex wrenches. And if you get a set with both, it's right. going to cover most projects. Precision screwdrivers are very small Phillips and slotted screwdrivers. And you're going to have sizes in the Phillips like zero, double zero, and triple zero. Mm -hmm. And with the slotted, you're going to have like 3 seconds, an eighth inch. You've got a lot of metric sizes. These are great for the small screws on thermostats, the set screws for the toilet paper holders or towel bars, 
although many of those are the hex screws. Mm -hmm. And it's also good if you have prescription glasses. Right. Tighten up the <laughs> frame. Adjustable wrenches have a C-shaped jaw with a thumb turn to adjust the jaw size. These are good to have to remove supply lines for plumbing repairs. They work for nuts, bolts, the toilet nut when you're replacing the toilet seal, right. and some furnace repair. Two sizes to have would be a 6-inch and a 10-inch adjustable wrench. Mm -hmm. If you're replacing a faucet, a basin wrench is going to get behind the bowl to remove the supply line at the faucet and remove the nut holding it in place for many faucets. Mm -hmm. There's some faucets that have a nut and a washer or a bolt, and in that case you'd need a Phillips screwdriver or an adjustable wrench. The basin wrench has a jaw that's spring-loaded, so this closes around a nut and it rotates 180 degrees. So you can use this to tighten or to loosen a nut or a faucet or supply line, and a larger handle is better than a short one because you can get behind deep kitchen sinks. Mm -hmm. For many projects, you're going to need just a standard slip joint pliers, and you can use these to loosen and tighten nuts and bolts for pulling, for grabbing, for bending material. Slip joint pliers have a jaw that adjusts generally to two sizes, although some will adjust to three different sizes. Eight-inch slip joint pliers are the most popular but six or eight is a good size to have in your toolbox. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at different pliers, let's say a slip joint and tongue and groove pliers, some of these sets can save you some money, and some will come with multiple pliers so you can get needle nose, your slip joint, and your tongue and groove all together. Some top-rated companies with these sets are from Stanley, Craftsman, Channel Lock, Irwin, it's I-R-W-I-N, and Nipex, it's K-N-I-P-E-X, although some people pronounce it Knipex. <laughs> some of the sets will come with diagonal pliers. These are used for cutting wire, nails, and staples. You're not going to use them as often as the other pliers. Sets that come with linesman pliers are for electrical projects and use a linesman pliers for cutting wires and cable, twisting wires together under a wire connector or deburring conduit. And these you won't be using as often as just the basic pliers. Right. A handy tool for some projects is a locking pliers. The jaw locks onto nuts and bolts, and it just stays in place until you release it. Generally, you have a lever to release the grip. Right. 10 inches is a common size in hardware stores and good for most projects. You can also get needle nose locking pliers. So if you have a nut that's or something. Exciting. <laughs> well, it's cool if you have something that's hard to reach mm -hmm. or, or it just doesn't turn, it's rusted in place. In fact, I just used regular needle nose pliers on a project. I had two hinge screws that broke off in a wood cabinet. Mm -hmm. And the screws are so small that it was just hard to use a screw extractor on it. So I took a 1 16th inch drill bit and I drilled all around the screw. I grabbed it with a needle nose pliers and just unscrewed it. Hmm. Then I took three wood toothpicks. I put wood glue on the toothpicks. I forced them in the hole and then I broke off the excess wood. I tapped it flush with a hammer. And then after 24 hours, it was able to take a new screw. Hmm. Good tip. If you're replacing a dishwasher, you would need a small adjustable wrench, an electrical tester, screwdrivers, pliers at a small level. You can use the level to make sure it's plumb and level. And levels are handy for putting in cabinets, leveling appliances. A two foot and a small level, eight to 10 inches long, are good sizes to have. A four foot level is gonna be more precise if you're doing projects like a deck or pavers if you're putting up partition walls or a mailbox post. Mm -hmm. Some top-rated levels come from Stanley, Empire, Milwaukee, Johnson, and Klein Tools. Many homeowners will be patching and painting walls and ceilings, so it's good to have some basic tools like a compound knife. And you should have two knives, a 6-inch and a 10-inch, or a 6-inch and a 12-inch. That's when you're doing patching and you're going to put two or three coats on. You want to keep spreading it out wider. Ten inches is easier to control if you have less experience. Right. Twelve inches is kind of big. Yeah. If you're just repairing settling cracks, holes, dents, and nail pops, those knives are all you're going to need for most projects. If you're doing larger repairs with sheets of drywall, 
You're going to need a cordless drill, a stud finder, a drywall saw. Some people like a drywall rasp if you're creating patches with pieces of drywall. So to like shave it down. Exactly. So they fit easy. A tape measure, utility knife, a drop cloth, and cloth drop claws are the best drop claws for drywall and painting. Well said. <laughs> Thank you. I put together some good sentences. <laughs> A drywall T-square is good to measure and use as a straight edge when you're cutting sheets of drywall. Mm -hmm. A mud pan is great to hold your compound. You can scrape off the excess from your blade, and it's easy to use when you're on a ladder. You should have a step ladder and a hammer. Right. And a two-inch stiff putty knife is good for a lot of painting and compounding projects for scraping. Mm -hmm. When you're picking a tape measure, a 25-foot tape is good for a wide range of projects. I would also have a small 6 to 12 inch tape measure. I like a utility knife that has storage for extra blades and a quick release button. That way you can change the blades and you don't have to remove a screw and open it up. Mm -hmm. For cutting into a lot of drywall or if you're using a utility knife to cut through flooring like luxury vinyl planks, a fixed blade allows you to use more pressure and you don't have to worry about breaking that sliding mechanism for a retractable blade. Okay. A good hammer for most projects is a 16-ounce smooth face hammer. Heavier hammers are good for decking or framing, but 16 ounces is probably the easiest for most people to control. And a smooth face, rather than a textured face, won't mar wood trim as easy if it slips off a nail head. <laughs> when you're shopping step ladders, compare the heights and the weight ratings. You should never stand on the top step or the first step down from the top step. Wood step ladders are very durable, they're lower cost, and they don't conduct electric as long as they're not wet. <laughs> Fiberglass is going to be lighter than wood, very durable, and they don't conduct electric. Aluminum is very lightweight and strong. It's great for inside projects if you're going to be moving the ladder a lot, mm -hmm. although it does conduct electric, so you've got to be conscious if you're working on projects, although you should always have the electric <laughs> off on any project you're working right. on. Most people are going to get about a four-foot reach over the height of the ladder. A six-foot step ladder is going to give you about a ten-foot reach, mm -hmm. and that's based on a five-foot, six-inch person, so it's going to be higher or lower depending on your height. Platform step ladders have one or two wider steps that you can usually get your whole foot onto. Yeah, so I like the, these better. Yeah, it's more comfortable if you're going to be standing for long periods on a ladder. Mm -hmm. And also compare the weight ratings. Think about all the people who will be using this ladder and if you're going to be lifting up any items mm. plus your weight on these ladders. Right. For trim removal, flooring, and demolition projects, a pull and pry bar removes nails much easier than a claw hammer. My son just removed all the tack strip from concrete floors in a condo we're remodeling, and it was really loud. I bet that was a lot of fun for him, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So think about safety glasses, hearing protection, and disposable respirators, right. depending on your project. I also like a pull and pry bar because you can pound it with a hammer to remove tiles or wood flooring. And a pull and pry bar was the first home improvement tool that I bought when I was a young guy wow. after watching this old house. <laughs> If you're doing projects where you're sanding, grinding, or cutting wood, metal, or other material, you should be wearing a disposable respirator rather than a dust mask, and this is going to protect your lungs. A disposable respirator will have NIOSH marked on it or the label. It's N-I-O-S-H. That stands for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. It's also going to have a letter N, R, or P. N means it's not resistant to oil, and this is for common projects like drywall or wood. Mm -hmm. R means it's somewhat resistant to oil, and P is very resistant to oil. The letter will have a number after it, usually 95, 99, or 100. 95 means it's blocking 95% of these very small particles, 0.3 microns or larger from the air. Mm -hmm. 99, it blocks 99% of these particles. 100 means it blocks 99.9% of the particles in the air. And an N95 mask is good for most projects that you'll be doing around the house. After this year, everybody knows what N95 is. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
If you plan on getting a cordless drill, take a look at some of the sets that include other tools that use the same battery and the charger. Like a combo kit? Yeah, they're pretty cool. So you can save money by getting multiple tools. And rather than having different batteries and chargers that you have to store, mm -hmm. it's going to save you money. Some come with bags, so you can carry them around. And you're generally not using all these tools at the same time anyway. Some top-rated companies with combo kits, DeWalt, Ryobi, R-Y-O-B-I, Milwaukee, Porter Cable, P-O-R-T-E-R, -E capital C-A-B-L-E, and Makita. Do you have anything else to add? You can do a lot of projects with just a small assortment of tools, and then I would either buy or rent specialty tools just when you need them. Mm -hmm. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our ebooks, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, books 1 through 12 on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. And you can follow us on Instagram, fixithomeimprovement. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Do, 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 do,